Hello, everyone. Jonathan Alexander here with the Los Angeles Review of Books, and I am really delighted to have today as my guest, Juliet Jakes, who is a uh, British writer, uh, journalist, has written a lot about film, wrote a memoir called Trans, which was published by Verso Books in 2015, and most recently has come out with an extraordinary short story collection called Variations by Influx Press. I'm going to hopefully spend a bit of time talking about this book, and uh, it's it's really rather remarkable play with genre. Juliet, thanks so much for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about how you came to write memoir. We'll start with trans. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting question. It sort of happened by accident. I hadn't really wanted to write about myself, but I think I sort of had as well. Mm -hmm. um, as a student, I was very interested in a lot of um, British and French post-war authors. Uh, so Alain Robguier, Marguerite Duras, the sort of nouveau roman group. Uh, and in Britain, people like Anne Quinn, Rainer Heppenstall, B.S. Johnson, who all did some quite interesting things with first person narration and experimented with the structure of books that were written in the first person. And that always really interested me. Um, but I was also reading a lot of trans theory. I sort of realized myself as a, as a trans person at quite a young age, suppressed it to some extent. And then in my early to mid twenties, started to discover American and Canadian trans theorists like Sandy Stone, Kate Bornstein, Leslie Feinberg, and, and this whole sort of 1990s school, who were interested in the fact that trans people had tended to write memoir as a way of countering transphobia, media sensationalism, um, certain types of feminist hostility towards trans people. Um, and it struck me in Britain in the late 2000s when I started transitioning that that was still a good form to use to reach a large audience. Mm -hmm. um, so I sort of fell into it really. And when I started transitioning, uh, a good friend of mine is a, a novelist and musician uh, and creative writing teacher called Joe Stretch. And I was telling Joe about the early days of transitions of difficulties I was having coming out to family and friends, colleagues, managing it with HR in the health service job I worked in, dealing with the public and, and so on. And Joe just said, look, you know, you should put all this into a blog and pitch it to The Guardian. They'll bite your hand off. Uh, and so I, I did that. I had a friend working there. So I sort of fell into it, really. It sort of happened almost by accident. But I brought something, I think, of those sort of literary techniques into both The Guardian column I wrote and the memoir. Uh, the Guardian column was quite popular. It was quite successful. So the, the gender reassignment process hadn't really been covered that way before in Britain as this kind of rolling blog uh, with open comments. Um, and so again, I mean, I hadn't really planned to turn it into a book because I, I had thought, well, I've said all I want to say in the columns, but again, someone came to me, a literary agent this time and, and said, well, you should turn this into a book. And we talked about how it would work as a memoir. And basically, um, I did it as, as a memoir, as a book, on the condition that I could bring a lot of the media criticism into it. I've always been really interested in uh, writers, and particularly filmmakers, like the, the wonderful British filmmaker Peter Watkins, who sort of work a lot of critique of their own form and of the idea of the media into the work. So Trans and Memoir became, yeah, partly a book about transitioning, but partly a book about realising myself through the British media and then trying to change that media. Yeah, no, I, and it's really remarkable in that regard. The 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 the, the young you so in love with different kinds of media is really one of the mm. fetching things about the about the book. Um, so I'm curious now because you've got this very powerful memoir, which is really about the the course of of your life, working through transition, and now you have a new book, uh, a set of short stories. Or, or at least they're being characterized as short stories. They really are rather genre bending. I mean, you've got things that are like transcripts and case studies and different kinds of analyses. And you do a lot of different genre play within the book. And I'm wondering about the move from what is a memoir, you know, tracking the development of a life to now what is a really, in my mind, tracking the development of a community, right? Or, or a way of, a set of ways of being in the world through multiple genres. Uh, 
Uh, is that a fair characterization of what's what's happened in that work, or how would you characterize it? It is, although, um, and there's there's no way you could know this, but the chronology is actually kind of the other way around. Ah. In that I conceived variations. I think when I was a an undergraduate in the early two thousands, uh, I've been reading a lot of queer fiction and quite experimental queer fiction. You know, William Burroughs, Jean Cocteau, yeah. some of Oscar Wilde, you no, know, that kind of thing. Jean Genet, and you know, this opened up a possibility of a trans literature, but I didn't, wasn't able to find a trans literature. All I could find was, was memoir. And so I had this idea, yeah, certainly by my kind of early 20s to write a collection of short stories that would have a variety of different trans characters at their core, but also use a variety of different forms. So I had a go at writing that in my mid 20s and I didn't really have the life experience or the writing experience to make it work. Uh, and ended up deciding that actually something probably a bit more pitched at the mainstream was what was needed in Britain at that point because mm. of you know, widespread lack of understanding of, of what trans lives were like. Uh, but, you know, was reading these theorists I mentioned earlier and was particularly inspired like a lot of trans writers by Sandy Stone, who wrote this manifesto called The Empire Strikes Back uh, in response to um, an anti-trans text by a writer called Janice Raymond. And in that, Stone argues that uh, it would be really useful for trans writers to break this sort of uh, culturally um, mandated silence around our lives and explore the space between male and female that comes out of transitioning or of just being trans or non-binary and think of ourselves as embodied genres, as embodied texts. Mm -hmm. So there's this really interesting relationship between gender and genre and indeed, you know, in French, they're, they're the same word. Uh, and as a student was reading a lot of Derrida, so uh, that you know, that came fairly naturally to me. And when I finished the memoir um, in 2014-15, I just wanted to go back to this variations project. And by then I think I had the sort of life experience and the, you know, sort of honed my writing enough to make um, that kind of very ambitious project feel like it was worth taking on. And the idea occurred to me to make it a history of trans and non-binary people in Britain, because I'd done a lot of research for a planned non-fiction uh, history of, of our community here, uh, which I ended up not doing. But fiction seemed like quite an interesting way to just raise a lot of questions um, in the absence of that much concrete evidence. Um, yeah. yeah. No, it's 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 really fascinating in that regard, and I love I love the story of you working on this book in some ways first, in many ways first, and then landing on perhaps the memoir. I don't want to say it's maybe the the more accessible way, but certainly as you were saying, memoir is a is a very powerful and popular way through which many writers mm -hmm. have been able to talk about their lives. Though I love the instinct of of. The, the 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 book variations in some ways coming first right you know playing with yeah that. well I mean that was that was the book I really wanted to write I mean the memoir sort of evolved as I said earlier in quite a strange way yeah. and you know almost kind of against myself so I ended up making a virtue of that and sort of you know in the memoir talking a lot about the the cultural pressures that have forced trans people to to focus on memoir and what if you wanted to do right. something else um and so variations is anticipated particularly in the interview with um with Sheila Hetty uh, at the end of, of Trans and Memoir that sort of reflects on uh, the narrative and on the, the writing of the book itself. Um, and Variations was a thing I always really wanted to do. And in a way it was a kind of reward to myself for sort of putting myself on the line yeah. with, with the autobiographical writing so much. Yeah, this is- Because so it's a kind of, sorry, it's, it's a kind of calmer form of writing. It attracts a very different and often less hostile audience. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed the sort of formal experimentation. I really loved doing the experimentation with genre that you're talking about. Yeah, let, let me let me let me test this with you just to see see if this this resonates. I really appreciate your discussion around the, the sort of cracking open different genres and and being able to write more uh, fluidly across genres within genres, thinking about. Yeah, it's a, a re, even a reward for yourself, right? That, that that trans people have have claimed this right to write in many different ways in many different genres about themselves. I think many of us queer folk uh, 
have been laboring under the sign of sexology, right? Where we have to sort of tell the, tell the truth of ourselves, confess. Mm -hmm. um, and so what about genre play? So there's a way in which I think queer and trans folk have come to genre play, mm -hmm. but also it harkens back to older historic, historical modes of how I think many queer and trans folk probably had to write about their lives more implicitly. You know, so you mentioned Oscar Wilde, and mm. I think Wilde is interesting. Wrote a novel, wrote many plays, wrote short stories. Also wrote this fascinating story, Portrait of W.H., which is this mm. kind of queer recuperation of, of Shakespeare. Here's Wilde, who probably could not be as open as maybe he wanted to be, although he certainly pushed the boundaries, experimenting with all of these different genres in order to be able to talk about the things that were important to him. Mm. And so there's a weird way in which what you're articulating is we're kind of ourselves recovering, you and variations recovering a very historically important play with genre as a way to articulate experience. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, there's so many things I could say in response to that. Yeah, please. Uh, the first is that I'm really glad you mentioned uh, Wilde's portrait of Mr. WH. Um, I, I teach a course uh, an at an adult education centre in London uh, on queer fiction. And um, the first set text I give the students is the portrait of Mr. WH. Lovely. And yeah. we use it to talk about plot structure and, and genre. Um, and it's, you know, so yeah, Wilde, Wilde was a big influence on the work. Um, and indeed, you know, this act of reclamation rediscovery, the second story in Variations, I think is perhaps my favourite. Mm. It's called A Woman of No Importance. Yeah. Uh, with a slash uh, in Wu Man. Yeah. Uh, and um, that's set around the Oscar Wilde trial because there is this really interesting queer, uh, well, obviously queer, but there's this interesting sort of proto-trans aspect to the Wilde story, um, particularly Alfred Taylor, who was tried alongside Wilde, um, was known sort of cross-dress. Wilde was fascinated by... Bolton and Park, who were these um, cross-dressers in um, mid-Victorian Britain, who had this very sort of high profile and quite a farcical trial, and all the stuff's in the story. And what I do in that story is create a fictional character who comes into the world around wild and this sort of late uh, 19th century demimond of sort of decadent London literature, mm. whose openness about their own cross-dressing in writing and in life uh, really threatens to sort of, you know, blow apart the sort of subterfuge um, that these people have had to had to bring into their work and into their lives, even more than the Wild Trial does. And of course, you know, what convicts Oscar Wilde is that um, he thinks that sort of coding his queerness into his work in the forms of these sort of various innuendos and sort of winks to people who understand uh, will protect him in a court of law, which is what happens to Bolton and Park. And of course, you know, 25 years later, uh, things have changed and his works are, are used to condemn him. Um, I mean, one other little thing about genre that you raised there and sexology, I mean, trans identities have been very shaped by sexologists because, you know, sort of sexological processes fed into the establishment of the gender identity clinics. And so the creation of these narratives that trans people would have to tell uh, to get treatment. Uh, and of course, that became a genre in itself. And then the genre that sort of reiterated in uh, a lot of transsexual memoir, and again, this is really crucial to Sandy Stone's uh, foundational essay that I mentioned earlier, is that, you know, there would be a sort of hero's journey style narrative, very, very conventional hero's journey style narrative, you know, someone's kind of on a quest, uh, and then a narrative that transsexual people were supposed to give to the gender identity clinics in order to get hormones and surgery. Um, and transsexual people, you know, sort of tended to be expert patients, would know what this narrative was, would swap tips, uh, and would just kind of offer it to the gender identity clinics on their kind of occasional appointments, you know, regardless of how true it was for them. And uh, another uh, story in the collection set in the 1970s called Standards of Care mm -hmm. is a sort of rediscovered diary by a, a transsexual woman in, in Norwich, mm -hmm. um, about two hours on the train from London, who you know, has a sort of tension between her sort of more conventional sort of uh, cultural sort of attitudes and tastes and her interest in this sort of, you know, burgeoning 70s counterculture, you know, from glam through to punk and post-punk, which has some fairly substantive queer elements. Um, 
and sort of also this tension between how she presents to the gender identity clinic and who she actually is um and you know trying to reconcile those things so so yeah that's that's all in there as well so I think I think trans people are you know trans writers I think very very aware of the uses and limits of of genre it totally makes sense and I I think uh, one of the gifts of the book is I think especially perhaps for for non-trans readers is a real glimpse in, into the historical emergence, uh, the kind of visibility of, of transness within our culture, uh, but then also sort of a reminder, I, I, I'm reminded sometimes of what Jack Halberstam talks about uh, when they talk about the, the messiness of our histories <laughs> and how embracing the messiness of all of our histories, our queer and trans histories is really important for us. If we're to continue to have a sense of possibility um mm. that's something that resonates with you because it's certainly something i get out of the book it's like why rehearse the histories if we're not actually looking for better ways to live yeah, yeah i mean i i did a history degree as an undergraduate mm. and um was always very interested in this in in two particular kind of concepts that i i came across quite early on one is this um, this idea that there's a sort of liberal conception of history whereby sort of freedoms just gradually unfold. And then this more radical conception of history where you have to fight the same struggles over and over again and things get better and get worse and get better again and get worse again. Uh, and I, I hold much more to the latter and I think that's reflected in the book. But also this idea that, um, and indeed the book was written, uh, you know, after a sort of upswing in trans visibility and rights, in the late 2000s and early 2010s, the book was really written in the period of 2015 to 20, when the British media in particular just launched this really quite sustained and vicious um, attack on trans visibility and you know, drove pretty much all trans writers back out of the, the mainstream of British news coverage. Um, so I think that feeds into the book, but there's also this sort of postmodern idea that you can't graft identities onto people who preceded them. Um, so it's quite interesting to raise questions through writing fiction, and particularly I really enjoyed doing those those two Victorian stories at the start of the book, where you know the the concepts of sexuality and gender identity haven't been delineated yet, and so all kind of cross dressing and what we now think of as like transgender behaviour is is just sort of sublimated into this sort of thing of of we don't like the look of this and indeed you know the the difference between the first story and the second story in variations is that by the time of the second story the authorities have come up with this category of gross indecency to just kind of be able to reach a broader range of of sexual and gender behaviors uh, and then of course the third story is about exactly this process of delineation it's called a reconfiguration uh, and the central character is the sexologist Havelock Ellis and it's a sort of academic paper uh, looking back at Ellis's process of um, of defining people's gender identities and the sort of mistakes that that he makes and the reasons why his sort of paradigm for understanding gender and sexuality ultimately falls by the wayside. Uh, so, so all of those things are in the book as well. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really remarkable for for that uh, and the, the sort of the transitoriness of history itself, right, becomes really one of the powerful themes of, of your book. I, I could quote just briefly from the beginning of Never Going Underground, you know, a, a story further into the collection. He said, amidst the bears and dykes, queers and straights who had crowded Albert Square, neither as packed nor as passionate as it was 12 years ago, but heartwarming nonetheless. And that's just, that's, that's a parenthetical right there. I'm not even going to complete the sentence. I, I just stopped at that parenthetical because it's, it, it's such a it's such a stylistically clever way to mark that even within communities, not just without them, but within communities, things are changing, things are shifting. So, uh, second to last question: Where where are we going now as queer and trans people? What's what do you think is what's on the horizon? Well, it's a good question, um, particularly in the the British context. I mean, there's there's been a story this week that the Council of Europe. Uh, we're discussing um, a, a sort of a resolution about how to deal with rising um, institutional and social and legal hostility to 
LGBT and queer people. And the countries they picked out were Poland, Hungary, the Russian Federation, Turkey, and the United Kingdom. Oh, wow. um, and a delegation from the Labour Party, our nominally left-wing party, asked for that passage to be struck out. Um, the motion fell and it, it went through. Um, but I mean, you know, even, even our sort of, you know, nominally, well, not left-wing, I mean, you know, the Labour Party had a brief period of being on the left here has been very much reclaimed for the right. Uh, but, you know, even our sort of nominally sort of liberal or liberal-ish institutions like the Guardian and the Labour Party have a huge institutional problem with transphobia in particular. Mm. So it's hard to say because I think until those organisations are turned around, yeah. then it's difficult. I mean, you know, the alternative obviously is um, is in the US where, of course, like Joe Biden became president and just immediately... Yeah. Uh, declared a greater commitment to to trans rights uh, but of course the problem for trans people is that we are very very dependent on um, accessible health care uh, which as I'm sure you and your listeners know is a, a huge problem in the states and a sort of a friend of mine here kind of grimly remarked that the future for for sort of trans visibility in this sort of liberal sense is you know the trans flag being painted on like f-35 planes you know um Oh. which is, is quite a cynical take on it, but also, you know, the way things have been going, I think is probably not inaccurate. Um, but a better future can be there for us if we're willing to fight for it and if we're willing to write for it. Um, you know, I think um, with us being kind of, for the moment, I think shut out again of bigger legacy media institutions here, um, you know, creating our own spaces to write, maybe using spaces abroad, um, using social media, I think is really important. Um, and much like with Section 28, um, the British legislation from the 80s that barred the promotion of homosexuality in schools, that sort of came after a years long uh, moral panic directed against gay men in particular in the midst of the AIDS crisis. Um, and that legislation was passed and stood for about 15 years. And as the story you mentioned, uh, documents, there was a hell of a fight to get rid of it. Um, and there's a similar thing being done to trans people here in the media and in politics at the moment. But I do think that in 10 or 20 years time, it will look quite different. Um, and I think a bit better. Let's hope so. I like I like your I like your your uh, comment. We can fight for it and we can write for it. I think that's great. <laughs> I so, say something quotable in these things. <laughs> wonderful. Think, yeah. So real quick, uh, a writer or artist, someone who is inspiring you, or someone we should be paying more attention to. Um. Yeah, I've name checked quite a few people already. I'm going to mention uh, an Argentinian writer who um, is dead now, who died uh, during the AIDS crisis, uh, called Copi. Uh, I think Raul de Monte was his birth name. Um, but he was a big inspiration on me as I could see variations in my mid twenties, um, in particular his play Ava Peron, which stipulated that Ava had to be played by a drag queen. <laughs> and, um, you know, really sort of portrays Evita as this, you know, sort of hysterical, capricious um, sort of woman. And, and in particular Juan Peron as this sort of controlling cynical monster who's incredibly cruel to her in life and then the second she dies it starts manipulating her image uh, and this was I think Copi was an exile from Argentina um, as you may imagine uh, and this was performed in Paris I think in 70 or 71 and, and kind of Peronists uh, attacked the theatre um, so Copi incredibly brave incredibly bold writer very very queer very upfront about that and you know not afraid to piss off anybody really so um yeah, I think, yeah, read, uh, read Ava Peron by Copi, it's, it's a hoot. That's great. Thank you so much. I've been talking with Juliet Jakes. Her most recent book is Variations. Juliet, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks a lot.